Hi, witchy people. You're listening to another episode of Tu Tia Bruja. I'm Bex Carlos, your host. We're almost to the halfway mark, which is great because I'm getting tired. Creating content every day is exhausting, but I love it. So for today's episode, I'm having a former colleague of mine, Catherine, come on the show. Catherine talks a little bit about what it is like to be a BIPOC individual in mostly white spaces, especially after having grown up in Miami, the perspective that that gave her. We talk about botanicas, we talk about brujeria. Let's get into the episode. Catherine, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. So just for the listeners, do you mind kind of just introducing yourself and, you know, as much as you feel comfortable and telling us a little bit about, you know, your background and who you are? So who am I? Yeah, you threw me back into my existential crisis. and I've had the last few months. Who am I? At my core, I consider myself an agent of change, much of a disruptor. And I think this disruption comes into play when I challenge traditional social structures and practices. And I know that in itself is a loaded response, and I have a lot of dissecting to do, but generally that's where I'm at with that question. (laughs) I think it's kind of made me, given you the perspective that you have, is that you're from Miami, which is a really fun place, but is kind of a shit show. (laughs) Yeah, it really is. So I currently live in D.C., and I work in the international development realm there. So it's been much of a change moving from somewhere that's a little more lawless (laughs) to... DC even though you know arguably it's it's another lawless place but yeah growing up in Miami what would you feel were major lessons that you learned pretty early on in life um so many of them I think the importance of culture and embracing your roots embracing your identity and you know living your life as your authentic self your authentic being that was a huge one for me you know I was never ashamed or disregarded for speaking Spanish, for eating, you know, gallo pinto, carne asada, typical Nicaraguan food, for repping my flag. So I really learned how to embrace myself and my culture in that way and my identity. I think the hustle I grew up around has really been my backbone to my personal success in the sense of approaching the world as an opportunity for me to grow and expand constantly. So I think that's a huge lesson. It's taught me not to tolerate shit from anybody. (laughs) And though I may not use the same tactics as Miami Catherine used to, I've gotten pretty good at setting my boundaries in a more diplomatic way. But trust me that that attitude of not taking shit for anybody is definitely still there. So thank you, Miami, for that. (laughs) But I think on the flip side, Miami also introduced me very early on to issues of racism, discrimination, labor exploitation, power imbalances, gentrification, you name it. I mean, Everyone's so busy just trying to make money, just trying to bring bread to the table that there's very little room left for civic engagement or thinking of these other, you know, things that are going on in the environment around us. But yeah. It's kind of sad that it made you realize a lot of things early on, but I think it's also, you know, I think that speaks to the fact that like Miami is a very culturally diverse place. I had a friend who said he lived there and, you know, moving from St. Louis to Miami, um, It's a place, one of the few places in the country where like per capita POCs of all types outrank like um, white people, (laughs) which is always a glorious thing uh, in my opinion. Um, But a lot, something else that there's a lot of um, in Miami is botanicas. Uh, Did you have a lot of experience going to them when you were younger or even, you know, as an adult today? I did when I was younger. Oh my gosh, you're taking me back to my memories with my grandmother so I remember as a kid just going with her to buy the agua florida to buy the herbs the candles the incense and stuff like that from my knowledge she did not practice santeria but she did go and constantly buy like these little knickknacks there put them on her altar and botanicas are just all over Miami all the time and I haven't been there as an adult but as a kid I, I used to go all the time So I went to my first Botanica in Miami because we don't have any here in St. Louis because there's not a big Latin culture. And um, even like, because sometimes if you go to a really nice Latinx or, you know, Mexican grocery store, like you'll still have candles and herbs and various things like that. Um, You know, I mean, there'll be some candles and there'll be some herbs, but depending on where you go, the candle selection isn't always um, on point. But I was so overwhelmed with what to get. Like, I didn't even know. I was like a kid in a candy store, and I probably only left with three oils and a couple of different 
prayer cards. We stopped there like on the way to the airport. So it was just a real quick, gotta get what I gotta get. I've heard that there's so many of them. When I was in Miami, I mostly just spent time in Miami Beach, which is a shame because... You know, I know there's like little Haiti and little Cuba and like all these different other neighborhoods where like the food is just amazing. Yes. As someone who's from there, like what are the neighborhoods that people have to check out? I would say Wynwood. I know it's super cliche, but I think that's, you know, it's kind of the art bowl of the city and I would recommend people go there. Little Haiti, there's a lot of great food, a lot of good art, and just so much to learn about the Haitian culture and how they built that entire basically the city um and let's see where else yeah i would say little haiti overtown winwood definitely hit up the beaches south beach sucks so i would recommend like north miami beach but those are generally my spots because i really did like miami but i just remember when i was there thinking like i feel like we're just seeing what we're seeing because we're going to a concert <laughs> in miami beach and I grew up in Kendall, and I would say Kendall, you know, I didn't even know Kendall was so different from the rest of Miami, uh, Dade County, until uh, I left Kendall <laughs> and moved to D.C. I guess just the way of being and, and the culture there is different. But I think Kendall, when, you know, when I think of Kendall, I think of, you know, the American dream, right? Like, I think over 70% of the population in Miami is foreign born. And, you know, growing up in Kendall, I definitely saw and experienced that. Everybody was from a different country. And you just got this vibe of like never ending hope. I mean, it's a place where migrants from all over the world, particularly in Latin America, go to create a new life from scratch. And the city is just so diverse in its Latin American culture that it really helps. um, It helps. It enables that kind of success for um, Latin American migrants. So, I mean, I think it's up and coming. (laughs) Um, It's pretty south. It's not what you see on TV, you guys. Like, what you see on TV is all, you know, just the Ritz and the Glam, and the majority of people in Miami cannot afford to live on the beach. So a question that I now have, because you've been someone who has had to, in workspaces, exist in a lot of white-centered spaces. What was that culture shock like of, you know, living in a place where arguably most of the people around either looked like you had more melanin you know like was that hard for you to adjust to a place that was so white focused oh my god where do I even start I guess let me start by saying that when I speak to white dominated spaces I'm mostly speaking to like white dominated culture right so under this frame when you think of what that means it's really the norms of the organizations institutions and systems that I've been exposed to while living in D.C., being rooted in white cultural norms that define behaviors and expectations like perfectionism, a sense of urgency, defensiveness, quantity over quality, individualism, etc. And I think these existing values and beliefs spread not only within the society, but also institutionally and the organizations that you work for, and then ultimately how you carry out your work. So with that said, that's kind of the way that I see my experience. And to be honest, it was just culture shock, really. It was culture shock for me. The way people interacted was different. The way people look at you is different. The way they spend their time and money is different. And I just had a really hard time adjusting. Like, I felt like I didn't belong there. The culture wasn't welcoming for me. And to be quite frank, like my first semester of grad school, which is why I moved up there back in 2013, I thought about dropping out. Um, I did not feel a sense of belonging. I didn't see anyone that looked like me, anyone that reflected my background, my experiences. And most everyone I knew or met came from privileged backgrounds. And I just could not relate to their reality and their ways of, of seeing things. And I actually had my first panic attack that same year. I went to the ER thinking I was having a heart attack. And I just, you know, I could usually control my mind and my thoughts, but this day I could just not control anything. Like my thoughts would not stop stop racing, all this self-doubt, limiting beliefs and pressure. I was just kind of putting up, you know, putting on myself and it was just all building up. And I went to the ER and they were just like, you're fine. You're not having a heart attack. You're having a, a panic attack. And I was just shocked because again, I've always considered myself to be someone that's mentally strong, but this was really like my, you know, breakdown that I was having and I went to the therapist you know a few weeks after that and it was a a white male cis therapist and he simply told me that I had experienced a panic attack and that I should get more sleep 
so I myself wasn't even understanding what it was that I was going through. I was trying so hard to understand, like, what is it about this environment that's triggering me in this way? Um, and trying to unpack that was difficult, especially when I couldn't find, you know, comfort or or advice from anybody around me at the time. And you're first gen, aren't you? I am, yeah. So my parents are immigrants, and I'm the firstborn in the country, and also first to go to college and first to leave leave the home, you know, leave the nest and to a completely different space. I grew up around blue collar workers. I didn't grow up around people who worked in offices all their lives and knew how to navigate politics and, you know, white dominated spaces. I grew up around people, you know, who worked at the post office, who worked at the local pizza joint. Um, that was my reality growing up. And I just didn't have that example or really understood how to navigate you know, the space that I was in now. Yeah. And I think that that's something that, you know, nobody prepares you for as a first gen is like the experiences that you're not prepared to deal with or the, how it feels at times to be in these spaces. And like, it's wonderful to be in these spaces and have opportunities that like our ancestors and stuff didn't have, but that doesn't mean it doesn't come with its own problem. Absolutely. Yes. You know, to your point, I tried my best to kind of channel like my inner ancestors and try to put myself in that place of, you know, I'm here for a reason, you know, my bloodline, my, you know, my past has brought me into this present for a reason. And I'm going to try and figure out what that reason is and what I need to overcome. But that process was very difficult when you don't have, um, you know, that, that support system or, you know, being first gen, you got to figure out so many things on your own and you just don't know where to start. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Tell me about it. That was very much, I feel like my struggle with leading up into college and then like post-college. And I feel like a lot of other people can relate. Um, well, one thing that you said that kind of made me think about something is, you know, being in these spaces and having to deal with like panic attacks and stuff like that, because you are being put in situations where you're like, not really sure how to react not really sure how to be you know that can cause a lot of internal thinking a lot of like internal you know doubt taking a quick pause so i love a one-stop shop for magic i want to be able to talk to the shop owner and get a reading also find candles also find any type of like powders or oils that I might need. And that's why I love Temperance Home and Bar. Melissa does a great job of having enough of everything. She carries a very stock shop that has a lot of different things. And she's always willing to make a customized, personalized item for you if you were looking for something that she might not have at the time. Definitely check her out. It's Melissa at Temperance Home and Bar. Let's get back into the episode. You know, did you do a lot of things to help, you know, either get you in touch with your spirituality in some type of way or, you know, maybe just keep you balanced? When I was in grad school, what I really relied on was just self-help. And I know this sounds really crazy, but I did a lot of reading, a lot of, you know, a lot of research online, a lot of YouTube videos, a lot of library book checkouts, talking to my friends and my family. And I was able to find a group of people who had similar experiences, you know, as I did. And that really just got me through initially until I found a therapy and I continued to, you know, dig through, do some shadow work, basically do a lot of shadow work, um, unpack a lot of the things that I, a lot of the baggage that I had brought with me that I hadn't really dealt with before, feelings of insecurities, uh, self-doubt, my imposter syndrome and how that was manifesting in the present you know, and just my, you know, that sense of like not belonging in this place. And I just, I can't really explain or pinpoint what it was exactly. I know it was definitely a mix of like me having this baggage from before, but also literally being put in a space that is not welcoming or was made to, to welcome people like myself. So I think what was really critical for me was just doing that initial step of building self-awareness and trying to understand myself and other people's experiences. And I will add a lot of alcohol. <laughs> I understand. You mentioned shadow work, which has been very helpful for me as well. Because I think, you know, it's so crazy how we internalize things, you know, when we're children to kind of still look at things through that lens as adults. 
And you really kind of have to like take the time, do the work to realize like, where did these feelings come from? Why do I feel this way? Because with shadow work, you really do connect to a lot of feelings that, you know, really kind of make you continue patterns that aren't healthy, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, what has your journey been like in terms of your shadow work? Like, do you feel like you've kind of known these things all along or were they completely new to you? So some were completely new to me because I feel like it took me a while to connect the dots of like, oh, well, this meant, you know, the reason you do this is because of this and this thought that you had as a child. And I guess it's like, you don't realize how events or just phrases or something like really impact you, you know, a kid, like, um, for example, okay, there might have been a time in your life where your mom was just like, hey, I'm busy right now. Like, I, I can't help you. Can you wait like 20 minutes? And as a child, like, it's possible that someone internalizes that as like, well, I'm not, you know, I'm not deserving of like, getting my needs met in a timely fashion. Which is such a dramatic response. But as a kid, like, that's how you feel. You know what I mean? So it's like, whenever I realize that I have a pattern that is continuing some type of behavior that I see flare up, I'm like, why do I do that? Like, where? And I've been doing a lot of meditating on stuff. I also personally am a fan of psychedelics. I don't think they're for everybody, but I did have an experience where I feel like I really addressed a lot of things in my inner child that were unhealed. So, you know, shadow work's different for everybody. <laughs> it's the, it's all about like kind of getting there wherever the there is for each person. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's just, it's like to your point, like identifying what those triggers are, where these triggers are coming from and what very nuanced, you know, major or minor experience happened in your life in the past or patterns of experiences happened that have led you to to where you're at. And that's absolutely, I think I've done more of that now than I did initially, to be quite honest with you, than I did back then. I actually started therapy last December and I've been uncovering more of that shadow work, like serious therapy. I did it short, you know, for a very brief period of time when I was in grad school. But I think it's been really great just kind of having a space to talk about you know some of the cultural things that you're taught as you know a Latinx woman you know it's like don't take up too much space don't be too loud don't be so opinionated and just the emotional tact of those microaggressions and then you know experiencing them in the real world outside of your culture it's just another layer of just like what the fuckness you know so I think it's been really useful to do that because it's been useful for me to take responsibility for my own ways of thinking and my own feelings and then understanding how to manifest that and do that better in, you know, in the world. And it's actually helped me a lot with my work. Like I had mentioned in the beginning, like I I definitely see myself as like someone who is, you know, an agent of transformative change. And I think as a part of doing this work, you need to really be in touch with yourself, right? You, you know, your inner and outer change, outer social change really need to be going in the same direction over aspirations. And at the same time that we're undergoing any larger change, we need to find that balance and that duality of work. You know, you can't just say, I want world peace, and then not try and work and find that peace within yourself. What you feel internally, and as a change maker, you need to really exert that outwards too. So I think a part of this healing process has not just been for the, you know, benefit of myself, but also for the benefit of the work and the, you know, the aspirations that I have to to make the world a better place. I'm really glad that you said that just because a lot of people who do this kind of work, you know, tend to run themselves ragged, I think, trying to do so much for other people and they don't take the time to really make sure that their cup is full because you really can't serve other people if you're running half empty. You know what I mean? As wonderful as it is, you know, to be so self-sacrificing, I think that sometimes that can demonstrate like a quality about ourselves that, you know, is kind of a problem as well. Because if you're always so self-sacrificing and you're not taking the time to like look inward, it's kind of just a distraction. Yeah, no, I think it's different for everybody. Um, I think that level of awareness needs to really come first. and I individual level and I think something that's really been shocking to me at least in my field of work is that 
it wasn't until after the assassination of George Floyd that people in my field started talking about racial inequity. And I was just like, what? Like, you work in international development. How are you not aware of social inequities in this country? You know, was I naive to think that you'd have an awareness of your role in our society and in our societal development? And it just really shocked me that people hadn't taken the time to reflect on their roles and how they contribute to and how they benefit from white dominance, right? And again, back to my point, I strongly feel that what's happening on the inside, it spills over into the work that you do outwards. And the fact that these people hadn't taken the time to think about their roles in their own country and their own communities, and they were out there trying to embrace equality and alleviate poverty in other parts of the world was very, very scary and telling to me. Um, And I think that if you don't do that work early on, it's ineffective, right? You're essentially perpetuating the same systems that have been in existence for so long. You know, these like neo-colonial systems, these imperialist systems, patriarchal systems, uh, systems of oppression. And it may be unintentional and maybe, um, and that's, and that's actually the problem, right? It's unintentional. It's, it's, there's no awareness to that. Well, think about all of the people who go on mission trips, all these like high school kids who go on these mission trips into some developing nation thinking that they're doing a world of good, but then like, they don't even acknowledge the lack of equity in their own country. It's the same thing. It's like people, it allows people to focus on a problem that they think is far away when it's like right in their backyard. You know, with having to find all these different ways to, you know, work on yourself and stay balanced, you know, while doing all this really amazing work, do you consider yourself a bruja? <laughs> I don't know what that means. Like, what? how would you define a bruja? Um, for me personally, I think a bruja is an individual who is living in their power and living with intention and uses unorthodox methods to ensure that the vision that they see happens. Hmm. I guess I would, yeah. <laughs> if that's the definition of a bruja, I would definitely consider myself one. I think through a lot of self-healing, you know, using therapy, meditation, has just really helped me better figure out how I can manifest what I want in life. I've been able to identify my my power, right? Acknowledge what my power is and leverage that power in my spheres of influence, whether that be in the workplace or, you know, even internally within my family as well. So finding my voice and just really meditating and putting soul intention and purpose in everything that I do and say has helped me shift my life in a way where I'm getting what I want out of life. I'm able to blend my spirituality with my work in social justice, my work in alleviating poverty around the world. And it's something I've never been able to do up until perhaps a year ago. So I would consider myself a buha in that sense. (laughs) I think a lot of people are. They just like, I don't know. I think that one, we've all been made to fear occultism coming from, you know, Catholic backgrounds. I think that a lot of that Even to this day, I feel like even though I'm like not doing anything evil, like I'm just like wishing for good and wishing good upon other people and just letting the universe play out the way it plays out. However, that doesn't mean that Catholic guilt doesn't run deep. And, you know, I don't know. It's just like for me, it's just a way of like with various herbalism and different things, because like I said, unorthodox methods and that's like everybody's methods are different. And with me, I've been getting like into herbalism and candle stuff because my sun sign is Leo and my rising is a Sagittarius which is also a fire sign and there's a couple of other like fire signs in my chart so fire is something that I just um seem to have a lot of which is I I would say that that's too I have a very intense ferocity so but anyway so fire and things like that tend to seem to be the thing that like when I'm trying to attract things to my life that seem to work the best for me first gens Whether they like it or not, I think are thrusted into the roles of like Bruja because we are also typically the ones who have to like stop a lot of generational curses. You had mentioned going to therapy. How many of your other family members like in your nuclear family go to therapy? Absolutely none. 
Exactly. Exactly. Same here. <laughs> I had to be the first one to go. And, you know, that that's very difficult in itself because, you know, having to explain and have the language for what's happening with you, you know, at mm-hmm. times is very difficult because our ancestors didn't know how to, our ancestors had to learn to survive. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and it's finally where we're getting to the time where, you know, we're able to survive, but not just survive, we're able to thrive. And we were able to gain knowledge that we're then able to give to the rest of our family, if that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. I can totally resonate with you on that point. I think, you know, when I was back home recently, like, you know, one of my parents, they were having trouble at work. And when we discussed it, the bottom line was that they had issues setting boundaries. They didn't know how to set healthy boundaries. And I just literally had a conversation with my therapist about this about a month ago, about me setting boundaries and how to do that and how to identify when you need one and things like that. And they were just like, wow, like you're so wise, you know, and it's such a simple concept, but it's when you're in that mindset of just surviving, right, of just taking whatever opportunity comes to you and doing what you got to do and living in that survival mindset, then it's difficult for you to to set those boundaries. It's difficult for you to thrive and to live. So yeah, it was a really interesting conversation that we had. And it made me realize, you know, like, wow, I'm breaking this because there was a point in time that I was just like them. I was, I had trouble setting boundaries and I'd burn myself down. I'd say yes to everything because I was just thankful and blessed and happy to be in the position that, that I was in. But now I'm like, no, to what you know, to what end am I going to burn myself out and say yes to everything? Like, I don't need to live in survival mode. I deserve to live and thrive. Preach, 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 preach. Mm -hmm. Well, Catherine, thank you so much for this. Is I think that this is like an important conversation to have for a lot of reasons, but also like just that focus on we need to have more patience with ourselves. We're dealing with a lot. We are having to be the ones who at times change the language around things that our family has just like grown to maybe accept as a way of being, but that's not necessarily how we have to live. And and there's something about having that power to help, you know, family members, just people gain the knowledge to like be better to themselves. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. And I feel like I definitely do that a lot with like my sister and my family to the extent that I can. Uh, just transfer this knowledge and, you know, wisdom and acknowledging that you guys don't need to live in survival mode. You don't need to bring yourself out for, you know, a hyper capitalist society. You can set your boundaries and this conversation must be ongoing. We need to break these generational curses (laughs) once and for all. Just get rid of them. Yes, 100%. Well, Catherine, where can everyone follow you and support you or... Is there a cause or a book or something that you might want to recommend to the listeners? Hmm. I would recommend to our listeners, well, to your listeners, <laughs> I would recommend the book Radical Compassion by Tara Brock. It's really about uncovering and untapping that negative voice in your head that's constantly telling you you're not enough. And, you know, when you're unproductive and you just give yourself shit for being unproductive and just those negative thoughts, it kind of, reframes that and helps you realize that you know there are better ways to to approach your feelings and your emotions when you're in that state of mind and I I just highly recommend it it teaches people how to love themselves and I gained so much out of that book it completely changed my life and I'm hoping it could possibly change other people's lives too Awesome. Okay, sure. I will definitely include the link to that in the show notes. Well, thank you again, Catherine. I hope you had a fun time. I really did. It was great catching up. And I'm so happy for you and everything that's going on for you right now. And thank you for thinking of me to do this. This is a really great conversation. That was the episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I included the book that Catherine included in the show notes. So please definitely check that out. Thank you again for listening. Be sure and follow the podcast on Instagram and Twitter at Tutia Bruja. You can also follow the podcast and myself on Patreon. We have one of those now. And you can follow me at Bexby Caston on Twitter and Instagram. And my website is BexbyCaston.com. All right. Thanks again. And I will see you tomorrow. Bye. Yeah.